Thanks, Irving. Can everybody hear me okay? You in the back? Yes? So, Britt, thanks very much for coming. Um, what about this view? Thanks for having me. It's great. gorgeous. It's, it's hard to concentrate. Um, <laughs> I'm glad so, I'm looking that way. <laughs> water, I just gaze off. So maybe you could start by telling everyone, uh, if they're not familiar, familiar with your work, what you do and how you came to do that. Sure. Um, so I am recently the GM for Eater and Curbed. Um, I took on this role at the beginning of April um, after nearly two and a half years as the editor-in-chief of Racked. Um, so I came to Vox Media two and a half years ago um, and have was largely tasked with sort of reshaping, restructuring, and rebuilding Racked, um, one of the properties that was acquired by the company when they acquired Curb Eater as well. Um, but before that, I was part of the great Yahoo Media experiment, um, <laughs> helping to launch their beauty site with Bobby Brown and then their style site with Josie, with whom I had worked at Elle magazine. Um, but I got my start at fashionista.com, um, where I was a blogger, um, just sort of try writing for free, trying to get clips to apply to grad school um, until that turned into a real thing, and wow. yeah. I'm sure we could spend an hour just talking about Yahoo and what that experience was like. Or we could talk about other things. Yeah, or we could, <laughs> I'm not gonna do that. Okay. Uh, but, so I'm, I'm interested in, uh, it, it feels like Racked, you mentioned that it sort of underwent a pretty big redesign, restructuring. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a bit about that? Why, why, why did you have to do that, and what were some of the challenges that you faced while you were doing that? Sure. Um, I, I, like I mentioned, when I started out blogging at Fashionista, there were a few other sites that were doing really cool things in the space that I was then obsessed with, which was fashion, and that was um, Refinery29 had recently launched, The Cut had recently launched, and there was Racked, which was just really fun and really spoke to something that was booming, especially in New York at the time, and that was sample sales. Um, and it talked about fashion in the way that I talked about it, which was sort of like, this is a cool, glamorous thing, but we should, probably shouldn't take it too seriously. Um, so I was a longtime fan of Racked, and I thought that they were producing really great work. Um, but I do think that one thing that is so special and so unique to Vox Media is how um, focused the, all the brands are, and the networks are, um, and how, uh, dedicated to their really obsessive audiences, um, whatever the topic may be. And I think that Racked had started to spread itself in a lot of different directions. Was it a woman's lifestyle site? Was it a fashion site? Was it a beauty site? Um, and I really wanted to take it back to its roots, which was shopping. Um, and shopping for, uh, for all kinds of people, specifically women. Um, we you know, dabbled in menswear and definitely covered it in, in a few different interesting ways, but um, I'd worked in fashion for a long time, um, and when I worked in fashion, people would find out I was a fashion editor and they would go, oh my God, is, is my outfit okay? <laughs> <laughs> and when I worked in beauty, women would say, oh my God, let me tell you about this amazing thing that really changed my life, or this lipstick that like, just makes me feel incredible when I walk out the door. Um, and I wanted to be able to bring that sort of excitement and accessibility and comfort um, back to fashion. And so that is shopping. How do real women shop? How do my friends in New York shop? How does my sister who lives in the Middle East shop? How does my mom who lives in California shop? Um, and was that because you were looking for something to sort of focus on, to focus a site around that would be like a competitive differentiator or? It was, a, like it was, was partly much? that. It was partly selfish. It was partly something that I'd heard from all the women I spoke to was sort of lacking. And it was mm. something about talking about shopping in a way that didn't underestimate it and that assumed that you could like to spend your money on shoes but also wanted to know you know how the new uh, tax system was going to affect the price of your jeans depending on where they were made um, and I think I think taking it seriously I think but also being able to laugh at it um, and was it more a feeling that you had or things that came out of people you talked to, or did you do market research? Or was I didn't do market no? research. No, oh, okay. It was like a gut feeling. It was a gut feeling. I mean, at that point, yeah, yeah, it was a gut feeling. It was, it was you know, having a sort of being, I had always worked, my, I started my writing career on the internet, and so knowing that this wasn't out there, that something that talked about these topics to, I don't really want to put an age on it because we had a very wide range of audience, but to women, specifically, I'm in my 30s, so women in their 30s who, um, who didn't necessarily want to dress like Kylie You felt Jenner. like there was a hole I there. felt like there was a hole there, yeah. And so what were some of the challenges of like taking a site that is doing so much and trying to narrow it down? Did you have to 
you know, let people go? Did you have to tell people, look, stop writing about that and write about this instead? Yeah, I mean, a lot of people left. <laughs> um, and we did let some people go. We made some structural changes. Um, you know, Vox, like a lot of young media companies, is a young media company. Um, so there wasn't really a lot of senior management. So putting that in place, um, making people really, you know, making it clear who people report to and that there is a reporting structure. And um, so there were some foundational basics like right. that. Um, and then we spent a lot of time coming up with, uh, I knew something was wrong when I got there and people kept saying, people on the team kept saying, well, is this a rap story? Is this a rap story? And I thought, well, you, if you don't know what a rap story <laughs> is, who's gonna know what a rap right. story is? Right. Um, so came up with a sort of internal tagline we used, which was just shopping for real life um, and shopping for things you put on your body, <laughs> which isn't, doesn't sound cool, it <laughs> wasn't. but it really made it clear so people could mm. sit there and say, well, is this, does it hit these two things? And if it did, then that was. And were you thinking at the time about, you know, just there's a market need, there's people who are interested in this, it, it will get readers, or were you thinking about monetization as well? Were you thinking about re there's revenue there? Were you thinking about I mean, how Rack did that? I, I, because I come from a fashion background, and um, one could say the lines are a little bit blurrier in that space. Um, I thought about monetization, but in a way that I would say Vox doesn't necessarily want its editorial teams thinking about monetization. In what way? Um, well, you know, church and state, and I think that's really important, and I think it's it's part of why, you know, I could do this based on my gut instinct without doing any market research, which is really important, or not thinking about the revenue. Were you thinking about, like, affiliate links and that type of stuff? Or? I wasn't at that okay. time, no. Um, we, we now have a, a commerce department and an incredible director of commerce and somebody who's trying to think about how we do that across the company in a really um, organic and meaningful and not at all like. And is that relatively new? That It is relatively new, yeah. Um, when I got to the company, we there were affiliate links in use, but they were used, they, it wasn't something that was top of mind. It wasn't something mm. that we talked about. Um, so no, I didn't set out to, I set out to change, to make sure that people knew what Racked was about um, and make sure that it had the kind of brand identity that something like Eater does. Um, and then I set out to, to grow it um, because it was relatively far behind in terms of mm. size compared to something like The Verge, which is, we're all far behind compared to The Verge, right. but <laughs> a beast. And were you looking at unique visitors and repeat visitors, engagement time? Yeah, I'll say when I got there, um, you know, I was hired to grow a website, but it was in the middle of, I mean, I guess this was almost three years ago. It was in the middle of this sort of crisis, not crisis, but do websites even matter? Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think crisis is. Yeah, it is that <laughs> it's too, too dramatic. But, um, and so had some sort of high level conversations about, well, what if we, sorry, take away chart feed and don't pay attention to, um, you know, how, how articles on the, on the site are necessarily doing and instead pick a couple of platforms, a couple of places where we think we could really win if we went all in, um, which sort of set us on a new journey. Interesting. Yeah. So did you, was there a lot of pushback to that? Because I think at the same time, lots of places were just starting to implement chart feed. You know, I'm not going to name any names, yeah. but people who, who, we're running traditional media sites. We're like, hey, there's right. this thing where you can see w what yeah. people are reading your stuff. Why did you think you there needed was to push, get away there from There was that? pushback, not pushback, but I think it was uncomfortable for the reporters who were used to just looking at Chartbeat to see mm -hmm. how their story was doing. And there was a sense of, well, how do I know if I'm doing right, right. doing well? And, and so that was a little jarring. And I think we definitely had to come up with some new ways of talking about analytics and insights and, um, and, and to, you know, and, and it sort of, there was no chart beat, so then people started to look, look into Twitter, which is just like a media black hole. And <laughs> right. it's just like, if people are talking about it on Twitter, it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> um, so yeah. So what did you turn to? What sort of stuff did you Well, the two, um, the two platforms are, that we sort of decided to focus on was we, we immediately spun up a video team um, and launched Facebook video. Um, and you know if that's doing well in much the same ways. Right. You can see you know, how long are people watching your videos? Um, are they sharing them? Uh, and then newsletters. Okay. Um, and newsletters. Uh, You're looking at open rates. And open rates, click through. Right. Um, our newsletter, Conversion. yeah. And our newsletter had um, affiliate links. Okay. Um, and also, what was really cool about our newsletter uh, is that we would get a lot of personal responses. Um, so people would engage directly, they would answer the newsletter basically, which um, had, had never happened before, it was really cool. Yeah, actually, we get that too. I get yeah. personal emails from people 
Not always complimentary, <laughs> but, uh, but it is interesting what, it's kind of uh, when people started saying, oh, email newsletters are the future. Well, email, everybody just assumed, I think, at the time was dead. Right. Newsletters seem like a kind of, you know, ancient technology, and yet they can be really, really powerful. I mean, open rates on some, uh, you know, newsletters are huge compared to, and you, it's a great sort of lead generation. It's such an intimate conversation yeah. that you're having with your audience, um, you know, and especially for them to, to sort of honor you by opening <laughs> the yeah. newsletter, let alone reading it. Um, Did, were there other newsletters or other companies that you looked at outside of Vox that you thought were doing well that you wanted to imitate or? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I definitely, I think um, for me, the, it was an interesting challenge because the newsletters that I read daily are, are the ones that are news, really right. news-based. So if I don't read this in the morning, am I not going to be able to engage in a conversation in the afternoon because I will have missed some big thing that happened? Do you read the skim? Uh, no. No. Because that's one people often mention as being a good one. Yes. Um, Anybody read the skim? Okay, some skim fans. And and what the skim has done is amazing. I yeah. mean, and they have in, like incredible an incredible community of readers who are yeah. super engaged. Um, and we definitely we talked about the skim a lot. Um, I think for me, they were one of the first ones that I looked at and thought, like that's the whole thing. It's not just like there's a, when it started. That's right, it. That's, that's it. all there was. It wasn't a tag like an add-on to a site. It was right. just that. And they were just incredible kind of rates of engagement. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So now you're running Curbed and Eater. What are the differences between them and Racked? You mentioned that you thought you were trying to get Racked to where Eater was in terms of its targeting or its you know, serving a market niche. Are they? Are you just sort of running them as is? Are you re reworking them? Are so you I'm not actually them? running okay. them. They have, both have, incredible editors-in-chief. Um, Amanda Clute is the boss over at Eater and Kelsey Keith at Curbed, and they've both built incredible networks um, that are doing really great work and growing exponentially, which is super exciting. Um, this role, the general manager role, is a relatively new role that was um, sort of first uh, fulfilled by Andrew Golis, who's the GM of okay. Box.com. And uh, so it's a largely experimental role that I think is gonna be quite different uh, depending on the brand. Um, and it, the role is responsible for, uh, thus far at least, it's, there's a lot of liaising with the rest of the company. Um, so whether that's working closely with Vox Entertainment on the TV shows that those brands are producing, uh, working with the experiential team on events that we might want to have around the brands, working with revenue to make sure that we're uh, really optimized for the best partnership opportunities, um, and thinking about how we bring these brands to life in a lot of ways, whether through partnerships or I mentioned events. Um, and, and just sort of pushing, uh, pushing forward on the business front in a lot of new and exciting ways, hopefully. I want to go back to something you said about uh, spinning up a video team. Obviously, a lot of sites did that mm -hmm. primarily because Facebook was made it clear that it was looking for video, right. specifically short form video. Um, some places have had a bad experience in that sense because Facebook sort of changed what it was interested in. A lot of short form videos weren't performing well weren't monetizing well. Did you guys have those sorts of issues or? Well, there's just no racked video team left. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, that answers that yeah. question. Um, yes, and, and I, I should say it grew exponentially and we had uh, we went all in on, on Facebook video and, and people watched our videos um, for Facebook. There was, uh, people watched them for a long time, which was really exciting, but it wasn't, we didn't, it wasn't monetized. And, right. and um, Facebook's monetization strategy in that department, I guess, was, Lacking, but I mean, it non, just non -existent. Um, non -existent. yeah, non-existent. Yeah. Um, so yes, I think that I mean, video is really expensive to make. How big was the team at one point? Uh, nine people, I believe. Hmm. And now no team. And are those nine people still at the company? Or? Uh, one of them is, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's. I mean, when you were talking about picking platforms, mm -hmm. obviously, you know, every media entity, I think, big or small you know, has to look at the distributed model, has to look at uh, network effects and how Facebook and Google and Twitter and Instagram are, are helping, but they are also, you know, you have to give up a lot of control that you have over what you do to an entity like Facebook. Is that, 
a struggle? Is that something you have to? I mean, I think, think what's about? so great about Vox, and I know I'm like a Vox fan girl, but I really do love it. Um, is that um, you really? There's no at places I worked before. It was chasing one platform after another. Mm -hmm. so, oh my God, there's a new platform. What are we going to do? Oh my God, how are we going to attack this one? How are we going to do that one? And we're a lot more thoughtful about what platforms actually make sense for this network, what platforms make sense for this audience, how are we gonna use them? Um, not in the sense of like having a long sort of dramatic plan in place, there's still a sense of risk and experiment and go for it and try it, but um, that there's no pressure to sort of be everything to everyone on every platform. And not that I think that that's possible, but I do think people still try to do that. So what were the criteria that you were looking at in terms of which platforms you should sort of invest in? Well, for, I, we, I mean, we had to grow Raft, and that was definitely a priority. And there, I was, it seemed to me that the fastest way to grow a massive audience was on Facebook video, mm. which was true. <laughs> um, so, so did that, it work in that sense? I mean, yeah, the, it did. in the short term, mm -hmm. you built a bigger audience, you yes. got more reach? Much bigger. Um, and I think we also, you know, and at the same time that we were doing that, we were, by focusing the brand and focusing the reporters and editors on um, how and what we were covering, I think we also simultaneously built a really stellar reputation for Racked. And people did really understand, do really understand, I mean, it's still, Racked is still there and it's still wonderful, um, understand what it stands for and what it's trying to do and how it's different from um, other brands that are, or networks, or sites, whatever you want to call them, that are in the same market. Because it feels like, obviously, Facebook is great for reach. Mm -hmm. You know, it's got a massive, massive network. Um, it's really low, sort of, in many cases, it's free. Um, you might even get a bit of revenue. But, you know, lots of those people are going to be drive-by, you know, folks who maybe have never heard of Rack. They click on something. Um, how do you, like, convert them? How do you get them to sort of become regular readers? You know, I think um, I think Eater actually does a really good job of this. You have very identifiable, high quality video. And I think if people can come to to, to spot your work in their feed and say, oh, like I, I can tell just from the thumbnail, from the language that's being used that this is um, an Eater video. And I love Eater videos, so I'm going to watch it. Um, or if it's a new person, then the third time, maybe they will. So I, I think it's it's about having a really strong brand. And do you track sort of how many people, you know, become kind of regular viewers or, or maybe they sign up for the newsletter or are you tracking oh, those? Oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, a, it's you want to know who your loyal audience is. And that's growing? Um, for which, for, for the company? Yeah, yeah. Or, or for Racked. <laughs> for Racked, well, I'm, I'm no longer okay. a part of Rapt, so okay. I, can't, I can't speak to that. Are those things working for Curbed and Eater as well? Yes. Yeah. And are they, would, would you say Facebook is, is it the majority driver of traffic? Is it? No, I mean, no? I, the, I mean, the thing about Facebook is like you, we, we have to work with Facebook and, yeah. and their, that relationship will always be there and it will always be a push pull and I don't think that Facebook is, m m uh, Melissa Bell, our publisher recently said that Facebook is neither the, um, it's, I think so, I'll, I'll paraphrase, but something like it's neither like the worst thing that's ever happened, but it's also not going to like be our salvation. Right. Um, and it just is, and it's a it's a partner that we work with, like we work with other partners, and it's a massive partner. Um, and but it's the, by no means the only it's the the only funnel to our audience. So what would be the sort of number one referrer of traffic for Curb and Eater? That's a good question, and I don't know the answer. Okay. <laughs> but I will say that I I think. Just do what Mark Zuckerberg did and say, I'll have my people get back to you. Oh my God, he said that. <laughs> Sorry. Um, no, I, 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 it's a really, there's a very diverse um, flow of audience, which I think mirrors the way we think about our business, which is that it's very diversified and there are a lot of different ways that. Um, you have a lot of organic traffic, like a lot of people just go straight to the yeah, site? Yeah, a lot of people just go straight to the site. And that was something that with Rack too, I remember getting there and, and looking at that number and being like, wow. I mean, these are brands that have been around for a really long time and have very loyal readers um, who are huge fans. Because I think that's the holy grail, right? Is to yeah. get people who just go there, yep. don't come through some other route. Yeah. Um, what other than Facebook, what sort of platforms is Instagram a big driver? Instagram is huge. Um, Eater hit a million this year, which is really exciting. Hit a million Instagram followers. Um, Curbed has one of the most beautiful Instagram feeds I've ever seen. I highly recommend you follow it and watch their stories. They're great. Um, 
So Instagram is, is a big tool that we all love and use. Newsletters are really big. Um, Eat on Eater, Amanda Clute, the EAC who I mentioned, has a great weekly newsletter where she, um, you know, the way she writes her sort of summation of the week or she'll tackle one topic um, and sort of run down all the food news you need to know is just, it's really delightful and has super high engagement. People love that. Um, as And there are a few other, um, a few of the critics on Eater also have their own personal newsletters. Um, Curbed it just launched a very cool sort of newsletter journey. It's called The Small Fix. Um, and it's just sort of a weekly challenge that you can take um, to sort of fix up your space, spruce it up. And sometimes it'll cost zero dollars and sometimes it'll suggest you buy something. Um, but it's um, it's sort of a, yeah, I think a newsletter journey, we call it. Um, but that's on top of the daily newsletter that they have. Um, so newsletters are great and fun. Um, what about Snapchat? Snapchat, neither of the brands are on Snapchat okay. right now. Um, Twitter? Twitter, yeah. Twitter is, I mean, everyone loves Twitter. Um, <laughs> and there's Twitter, and they both ha are on YouTube. Uh, well, not, not Curbed, but Eater has a great YouTube program, um, as well Curbed as Facebook isn't? Video. No. Why not? Um, well, Curbed doesn't have a video team either. Okay. Yeah. Um, and podcasts are also big things. The mm. Eater Upsell is a great podcast. Um, are those new? No, the Eater Upsell has been around for quite a bit. Um, mm. I believe Nigel Lawson was on last week, so there are always fun chefs stopping by, um, which is great, and it's hosted by Amanda. Um, Does anybody go to Eater? Eater fans? Okay. Curbed? You? Hmm. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, if uh, do we have a mic? If Okay. So uh, if anybody has any questions, just put your hand up. Um, are there any right now? Nope. Okay, well, think of some. I have some, obviously. Um, I wondered, so how much time do you spend thinking about, because I think one of the challenges with Facebook is they keep changing their mind all the time. So, if, you know, they said, we want short form video, lots of people. I don't know, spend put a together. lot of time thinking about you Facebook. You don't think about it? No? <laughs> Not a lot of time thinking about okay. Facebook, no. Um, right now, I'm spending a lot of time, um, sort of, I've worked in fashion and beauty for a very long time, so I'm trying to learn um, at a very rapid clip all about the food industry, all about the um, design and uh, architecture and uh, interiors to an extent worlds um, to really understand those two brands as I am trying to build them up. Um, and to think about how we can push these two networks that are so great forward. Um, so that's really what I'm thinking about. So Facebook, you don't, <laughs> you don't lie awake at night wondering if they're going to change, Absolutely change not. their algorithm and ruin your business. I do not, yeah. That's good. Yeah, good for you. I'm sorry for anyone who does. No, no, good for you. Um, so in terms of... You can't let one, one platform <laughs> dominate your life in that way. No, but I think, I think for, for a bunch of reasons, there are media entities who kind of did go all in on Facebook, sure. and uh, you know, one of the risks is you, you're at the sort of whims of that platform. If they decide they're no longer interested in short short form video, they change the, I'd the algorithm. I'd recommend not going all in on one platform. So I guess the alternative is, uh, you know, you have to do multiple things at the same time. Mm -hmm. You have to do newsletters well. You have to do maybe video well. You have to do Facebook well. You have to do, you know. But audiences you have to consume their content on multiple places at the same time. Sure. So, yeah. But I think it's difficult, particularly for smaller media entities, to, to kind of do all those things at once. Um, because they do take different skills. They may take different resources. You may have to, you know, if you're a small uh, publisher, it's hard to kind of, I think that's where, in some cases, the, the impetus comes to go all in on one thing, because then you can just focus on that instead of trying to do like five or six things at the same time. I mean, I think it depends on what type of business you're trying to build. You can go all in on a newsletter because right. like, I don't, Gmail's not going away. Right, email's not um, And they're not, you know, they're not dictating the way in which you use that. Um, you can launch, um, you can start an Instagram account and just sort of post really beautiful original photography and grow your personal brand in that way. Um, and hope that, I mean, and, and that algorithm, you know, that algorithm might not be great for you in a month, but um, it, that to me is different than the way we're talking about our brands using sure. multiple platforms. Because you're, I mean, 
Question? Can, can you wait for the mic? Just because we're streaming. Sorry. Hi. <laughs> Hi, could you talk a little bit about your revenue model? Sure, um, yeah, so Vox Media has a pretty, um, I, I'm not sure the best, <laughs> I, it's very rude to not look at you as I answer. Um, and I'm supposed to go this way for the mic. Um, it's a very diversified model. So we have, um, we have branded content coming out of Vox Creative, our in-house studio. Um, we have display advertising, of course, we have um, our experiential business, so we have events like um, the Code Conference, which is happening in a few weeks uh, from Recode, um, and they, Recode actually has a few conferences. They also have Code Commerce, which takes place uh, in New York. Um, we have um, Concert, which is our sort of um, ad marketplace. I'm not the best person to talk about Concert, but I do understand that, and that goes against, uh, um, Quartz is our newest partner there. Um, and it's sort of a ad network that uh, extends across, that other um, publishers can buy into. And then we have um, a few more recent additions. So we have podcasts, which we're really thinking about in a creative way. In 2018, um, I'm not sure, there was uh, some great coverage about uh, Kara, HBO's new um, Silicon Valley ads running on Kara's, which mm -hmm. is new podcast, which is very fun. Um, so really, and that's a great example of really thinking outside the box in new ways to to create revenue. Um, so podcast is a big one. We have commerce, which I mentioned, is something we're, um, you know, put some effort into last year, and now we're really doubling down on that because those sort of small efforts did really, not small, they were a lot for the people who That's were That's affiliate them. links. That's affiliate links, mm-hmm. Um, and then also um, television, which is a thing that we are, that we'll be seeing a lot of this year. Um, we have the Netflix show Explained, um, coming from Vox.com. Um, Eater's show is called No Passport Required. It's hosted by Marcus Samuelson on PBS. Um, there's a show called Foul Play that SB Nation is doing with Go90. Um, Liz Plank's new show, or not new show, but old show, newly on Twitter, Divided States of Women. Um, on CNN, I'm working closely with the team on a show called American Style, which is very cool. Um, so there are a lot of different streams of revenue, um, which is part of what I think is so great about it. Um, I don't know if I can speak to, to, to the... The question was, is Vox profitable? No. Yeah, I'm not sure if I'm at, uh, how much I am, uh, like, can share about our sort of revenue numbers. <laughs> no, what, I understand. What, I mean, what I can say is... What happens in Toronto the, stays in the, Toronto. The, so that, like, no, no one's going to talk about it. It's live stream. No, no, it's not. The stream, <laughs> we're not streaming. It's, we're just talking amongst it's ourselves. It's live stream. I mean, Vox is doing great. Uh, Vox is doing... Sorry? Yeah. I think the aim is to be profitable within the next few years. Um, I, I think you know Vox is doing really well in a very um, not great market, um, and so uh, we are up year over year. Um, are all of those revenue um, factors going up, or are some of them going down? Because display advertising not a great business at the moment. I th I'm pretty sure they're all going up, but again. That's, I mean, I, I, could, I could speak um, better about the brands that I work on. Do the TV shows drive revenue or are they primarily marketing? Um, eventually they will, yeah, they will, and they do. Um, uh, how much remains to be seen, it's very right. much experimental. The Netflix show, I believe, will be the first one to premiere. Um, and yeah, they, they drive revenue. They're part of the sort of the, the in 2018. I think podcasts and TV and commerce are sort of the big new things that we're really paying attention to. One back here and then up front. Uh, good morning. I enjoy Curbed. I notice you're in about 15 cities around the country. Would you talk about how you acquire content and why you're in those cities and not in others? Although I have seen content on your site from cities that aren't listed on your your website, and are those freelance journalists, and are they staff journalists, and, and how are they compensated? Sure, um, they, it's a mix of full-time and freelance. Um, those cities um, are chosen as, they're really the centers of the things that are going on. I think that if 
curbed could, they would have um, an editor in every city. Um, but yes, the, the, the local news and the local, especially on curbed, um, the local coverage of what's happening in these cities, I think, is, is a key part of their editorial strategy. And I think that it's the same with Eater. Um, and it really sets them apart from having journalists. Um, you know, there are other places that will send journalists to a city to report a story, um, to try a restaurant, to sort of spend a couple weeks there. Um, but these are people, these are journalists who are actually embedded in those places and who um, know them inside and out and have lived there for a very long time and know, you know, the people that they're writing about and the places that they're talking about. Um, and that, I think, is part of what makes these two brands so special, these two networks. Um, how are they compensated? Um, they're, I mean, for the, they're paid. <laughs> um, and yeah, they're paid for their time. I think we had one. And then back here. So related to that, I'm curious how you figure out as a network with local editorial strategies in all these different places, mm -hmm. what needs to be centralized about your editorial strategy and what mm. needs to be localized and what that relationship looks like between you and, and the people in these markets, um, the push and pull of that, essentially. Good yeah, point, that's point. a really great question. Um, and I, you know, for Kelsey Keith, the editor-in-chief of Curb, um, we'll talk about how when she got to Curbed about three and a half years ago, it was very um, scattered and there was sort of no centralized editorial team. Um, not no centralized editorial team, but no centralized editorial mission and all of the local editors were very much sort of doing their own thing. Um, and I can speak to the same experience when I got to Racked. Um, and so a big part of what she's done over the past three years is really develop a singular editorial mission and voice um, that you can easily identify by looking at the curbed.com national site, um, much like eater.com has a national anchor site um, to sort of be the anchor to all of their, I believe eater has 24 um, city sites. And from there, I think um, having a city's editor who, there is a city's editor on both sites who oversees all of those local editors. Um, and they are largely, you know, they're in the editorial, um, editorial phone calls that we do um, to make sure everyone's on the same page and talk about what people are working on. Um, and having this really, oh, sorry, having a really um, centralized discussion about what the brand means and, and sort of never giving up on that. Um, never sort of being like, okay, everyone gets it, now that's it. Um, but really hammering at home and then making sure that all of that is leveling, leveling up, especially, you know, for Curbed, I think right now there's so many interesting things happening at the local level that have a lot of national interest. Um, so making sure those things are being surfaced on the national page so that it's a really, like, great cycle. Of so is it a combination of sort of things coming up from local sites and also kind of vision coming down? Yeah. You try and do both question. of those things? Yeah. I think, yeah, the gentleman first. Thanks. Um, if you could just go back to the newsletter journey uh, thing you mentioned, could you just say that one more time? And then why did you all decide to get into that? Sort of like what role does that play in your audience engagement or sort of monetization strategy? Where does that fit? Yeah, so um, the newsletter journey will be, um, it'll be something you sign up for and it'll send you a welcome email and then it'll say, um, thanks for signing up for our newsletter journey. And I don't even know, uh, journey is just the, use, the word we've used for it. Um, and then you will get a follow, you'll get the next email the next week and it'll be about four weeks of, I believe this one's four weeks, four weeks of, of emails. Um, and I think, you know, we talked about newsletters as, uh, newsletters are a really intimate conversation you're having with your audience and it's something that they have to really be excited about um, and that has to really stand out in a very packed inbox. Um, and I think that there is something fun about having it be a shorter version um, so that you aren't necessarily committing to getting a newsletter from these people every day for the next the rest of your life or until you unsubscribe. Um, but it's something that you can actually take action on. And so I think it's just another way of engaging your audience and having fun with something. Um, it's a, a brief thing and it, it's not built for revenue. Um, it's built to find new ways to talk to the audience and then sort of see how that goes and then maybe take it to the next step. But you do get revenue from our newsletters? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And there was one, yeah. I've already stolen the mic. Um, I was hoping you could talk a little bit more about the affiliate link strategy that you're using across the properties that you work on. It seems like it's a big growing trend in a lot of places right now. So how do you balance that? Because I think one of the things that Racked and Eater and a lot of the brands you've been talking about have is like this big sense of trust with the audience. Mm -hmm. And I think that can mm. be a risky move for brands like that. So how are you thinking about it? Yeah, it's interesting to hear affiliates referred to as a trend, affiliate linking, because <laughs> I come from fashion and I've worked in this 
world for like 13 years now and there have always been affiliate links. Um, and this is maybe the first place I've worked where we disclose them. Um, and we- Really? This is the first place you worked where they disclosed them? Yeah. Um, so lots of people were doing them but not telling anyone. Yeah, and I think, you know, uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and so I will say we have thought long and hard. I have sat in many meetings um, with our director of commerce and looked at the um, looked at the language and look at the way in which we're talking about um, our affiliate linking. We um, is it disclosed on every story? It's disclosed on every story that has an affiliate link, mm -hmm. and uh, and it's disclosed at the top of the the article. Um, and thinking about how we separate sort of commerce driven content from our other content. Um, and making sure that it's that it that it's a separate sort of channel. Um, so there's there's two things, right? There's they're not a mixed. They're, yeah. Well, they're they're not. There's sort of two separate ways we do it, and one is where it's just all commerce, um, and and that's sort of identified as a, a commerce sort of channel. And then there's another where it might just be. I'll, I'll speak to how it was on Raft. So um, you know, it'll be like ten pairs of jeans that will make you look great. We would never write that, but <laughs> <laughs> something like that. And then there will be affiliate links in there. And even in something like that, that's purely editorial and maybe half of them are linked to our affiliate links and half of them aren't because we feature a lot of um, designers or brands that don't aren't necessarily big enough to even have an affiliate program. But even that will have um, a, a, a disclosure at the top. Is there content that you specifically create? I guess that commerce channel you mentioned so affiliate links drive the content in the sense that yeah. you know, it would be good to come up with something that we could put these specific links in? And even that is created by the commerce team. It's not created by the editorial teams. But it looks like editorial. It looks like, it, yeah, and, and it is, but it's on the, on the sort of commerce page and it has, the, it has the same disclosures. And it says that it's written by the commerce team. Because hmm. I know, I think I know what Celeste is driving at, uh, you know, there's a risk that people will not read the fine print or, and sort of, that the lines will blur in a way between editorial and commerce. I mean, I think if you're thoughtful about it and you're honest with your reader, at your audience, and that you sort of address it up front and make sure it's crystal clear, it's, it's, I don't, I, I don't think that it's a chance to really lose the readers, the audience trust. Um, yeah. Yes. Hi. My question is about Eater specifically and kind of your recent uh, forays into international expansion and how that's going. Oh, um, it's going great. <laughs> Eater London is... Um, is that brand, brand new? Eater London launched last year um, and it's doing really well um, and it's really exciting and I think, um, you know, we just launched... Um, a guide to Rome. Um, so we hired Les uh, Leslie Suter is the new, relatively new Eater travel editor. Um, and so we are thinking a lot about international, um, which is really exciting. I think it's something people want. I think it is, you know, we see that people use Eater, especially when they travel. Um, and so having these international guides is really, really fun. It's fun for the team. They, they look beautiful. They're fun to use. Um, and based on the success of Eater London, I think we're definitely interested in doing more. But sometimes those markets require different things, you know, editorially speaking, like things that would work or be seen as normal, you know, in the U.S. might not fly. Have you noticed anything? Sure. So we didn't hire someone in New York and, like, move them to London to run Eater London. We hired someone who lives in London, right. has worked in the food world in London, and has that understanding and those relationships. I shouldn't say we because I didn't hire the person, <laughs> but Amanda did, and Amanda's very thoughtful the royal about things like this are done. Any questions over here? My back is to you, so it's hard to see. Any over here? We got time for a couple more. So if you have one, put your hand up, because we're running out of time. Um, I'm wondering, this is sort of a weird question, because you work for a large entity, but I mean, you got your start as a blogger. Mm -hmm. um, what if you were starting today? W what if you were just, you know, you're just out of school, or you want to get into oh. media or journalism, what would you do? I mean, could I go to grad school without incurring debt? <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh. <laughs> I don't know. That's a terrifying question. Because blogs don't seem like a thing anymore. 
in the same way they were. So sad. You know, they were so. It fun. is sad. I mean, and I think a lot of what we do at, at Vox is actually bloggy. What based in blogging, right. you know, there's the the voices are really strong. Um, the it's funny. It doesn't take everything seriously. You know, we do serious long form investigative journalism that wins awards, which is incredible. But then there's also just fans. I mean, I think that's that, and I think that might actually be the SB Nation um, tagline. But it's it's true across the company, which is that. We write about the stuff that we're obsessed with for people who are obsessed with the stuff. <laughs> and so it's coming from a place of genuine excitement. You know, there's been this huge, like, scandal in New York about a, a salad chain that will, is going right. to no longer chop their salads. And the Eater team is just up in arms, and it's been this really funny, um, you know, funny to witness this debate in the office. I sit by the Eater team, um, and the way that they write about it, they are so invested <laughs> in this very funny thing that that their audience, who's also obsessed with food, is probably also similarly invested in. Um, and so, I didn't answer, but anyway, I'm just lamenting the, the I was lamenting the loss of blogging, but right. actually blogging is alive and well and wonderful. It's just um, called something different now. It's called something different. So what would you, how what would you would I do? Start? I would, um, Facebook page? Oh, no, I, you and you're obsessed with Facebook. No, no, I'm just saying. <laughs> I mean, you get a lot of reach through Facebook. Yeah, right? that's why um, people. Go I would there. probably I, a newsletter. I think probably um, because I because I think it's a good way to experiment with your voice, and I think that a lot of the newsletters that are um, that are doing that right now are really just fun to read. Um, but yeah, I, I guess mean, the I challenge might... the challenge with a newsletter is let's say I start one, I'm nobody from nowhere. You know, I, I start a newsletter, then what? You know, how do I? Well, do you have do any you, friends? I have a couple of friends. So you'd send it to them. But and I maybe one of them would like I it enough I doubt to they send would it to subscribe. their friend. Yeah, but let's, so then how do you scale that? Like, so well, are I've you got trying to scale it or friends. are you trying to, are you asking me if I graduate and I'm trying to like become a better writer or I'm trying to start like a lucrative business? Yeah, so no, I'm that's a good question because obviously it, into... it depends on what your motivation is. Do you want to yeah. build a big business and make lots of money, or do you just want to write about things that you're passionate about? I right. mean, at some point, you have to make money from it, right? So sure. But if I'm 21 and just graduate from college, then I'm probably like Living waitressing folks, and yeah. working retail and maybe just want to be a better writer. So would you focus on, I mean, I guess that's what you did with a blog. Would you yeah. just focus on writing about things that you care about or are passionate about? And then... Yeah, I mean, I really, I really wanted to work in fashion. Um, I had moved from San Francisco to a small town in Sonoma County when I was in high school, and I wanted nothing more than to get to New York and work in fashion and go to Paris and cover the shows. And I was a voracious reader. All I did was read. Um, so therefore, I was a pretty good writer, and so I knew that that was my way in to mm. this world that I had actually no access to. Did you just cold call people or walk up to them at shows? Or? I studied abroad in London um, and emailed Stella McCartney and said, can I intern for you while I am here studying abroad? And that was my end. And I went to my interview and the guy was like, can you start now? And I was like, sure, I don't know anything. Um, and then they were moving all of, they were moving their PR operation in house in, in New York um, when, the same month I was graduating from college, I went to BU, um, and they said, can you come do this? And I said, sure. And then I realized very quickly that like PR is here and journalism is mm -hmm. here, and I actually wanted to go this way, so I left that and was work, worked retail for a year until Fashionista launched and said, can I write for you for free? I think I have to go to grad school if I want to do this other thing. And she sat, the then editor, the founding editor sat me down and said, do not go to grad school if you want to write about fashion, just come hang out here for a bit. Yeah. Do you ever wish you had gone to grad school? No, I don't, <laughs> I don't have any debt. <laughs> We've got time for one more question. It's got to be really good, though. Is it really good? So good. Okay, so good. <laughs> Go. So, um, I mean, editorial voice is a concept. I'm still, it's funny, like I've been in journalism over 20 years, and I still couldn't precisely define it. Um, but at the same time, you know, I think we have an intuitive sense as to what it is. Don't worry, this is not some long statement masquerade. Okay. So, um, <laughs> but I'd, I'd be curious to know, what do you appreciate now about editorial voice that, that you didn't at all at the beginning when you started to actually seriously think about it as, as an approach, as a strategy towards growth? Well, I actually think I've always, I appreciated editorial voice before I knew what editorial voice was. And I think that comes back to being 
a voracious reader as a kid and being able to, you know, whether it was a book or a magazine article or something in the newspaper and just really sort of feeling that per the person who was writing and feeling their language and the way that they spoke, I think. Um, and so I, I think voice is, in, is everything, really. Um, and I, and I, I don't know that I, that I ever didn't appreciate it. So I, I'm, I'm not sure if that answers your question. It is something you, you <laughs> mentioned, though, like particularly with Eater, mm -hmm. that that's what drives, that sort of passion flows out of the writers and, the, right. and that's their connection with the audience is their kind of passion about that thing as and, opposed to... And people will follow that voice wherever it goes. You know, people have their sort of the bylines that they follow. They might not even realize that they're following that byline, but somebody who really speaks to them and who, um, you know, and that'll, that comes to life in so many different ways. Like we did a big activation at South By called the Deep End this year. Um, and people were lining up around the block to, to come in and sort of meet the people who they read on the internet every day or they listen to their podcast. Um, and I think that that sort of really, that community and that loyal audience is, is how you make the magic happen. That's something we, wow, well, we're totally out of time. That, uh, that's one thing we didn't get into that I was gonna ask about is the sort of physical aspect of like people love to read on the internet but eventually they kind of want to meet people in real life at events like this that's got to be a big part of what you know vox is thinking about what lots of media companies are thinking about how can we do because events obviously are expensive right they're hard to scale um you know they take specific expertise but is that a big part of what yeah, it's a big part. We have a, I mean, we have a great um, experiential team at the company, um, a great conferences team, and they, you know, throw events like Code, which are massive and huge and lucrative. Um, there's also Code Commerce, which I think I mentioned. We did the big, um, the Deep End this year, which was a big event we did at South by, and that sort of involved all of the brands, which was very cool. And I think what's cool about events like something like South by is that it's really more for the audience than for the industry. Right. Um, and I think that we are very interested in engaging with our audience in real life. Great. Well, on that note, uh, thanks very much for coming. Please Thank you. Uh, give Britt our thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Britt. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, I have just a really brief announcement. Also, I think this morning I assumed everybody knows who I am, but just in case you do not. <laughs> I am Trevor Noblick. I'm head of programs and events here at ONA. Um, just a quick announcement about uh, breaks and breakouts. Um, during the break, we have coffee here, but we also have coffee downstairs. So where the Nahani room is, if you keep going, there's the room Fundy and the room Grossmorn. Uh, Chartbeat and Social Flow actually have office hours set up. There's already coffee and snacks down there, so it's a great time to grab some of those uh, and chat with some of our sponsors. Um, during the breakouts, in this room, obviously, we would be at about half size. So if you could start to migrate more into the center, that helps the presenters so they don't have to look all the way out to the wings. And again, Nahani is one floor down uh, on the 16th floor. A couple of folks have asked about the hashtag. I see most of you have found it, but it's hashtag ONA Insights. So if you're looking for the conversation, it's already started there. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>